Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it's always good if there are more listeners than speakers, so I think we're okay tonight. What I'll try to do um, today is to compare the UK situations, UK situation and the Dutch situation in terms of flood policy and flood measurement uh, measures. Um, as you all know, recent floods in the, in the United Kingdom have led to debates within the country on its flood protection policy. And experts from the Netherlands, a country often seen as a standard to follow in, in terms of flood protection, are involved in that debate as well. So comparison between the Dutch and UK situations uh, might help to explain how differences in water systems properties, uh, economic development, and ideas on national security and local security actually result in different flooding policies and patterns in these uh, two countries. Now, I don't think I will offer that many solutions to UK floods, or Dutch floods for that matter. Uh, I might be able to shed some light on how to understand them in relation to uh, decisions to be made, priorities made, and the type of floods we are talking about. Now, in order to do so, I will actually start in Nigeria, which might not be the best place to start for a talk about the United Kingdom and the Netherlands in the wet and cold northwest of Europe. Now we are in northern Nigeria and we see a very proud Dutch irrigation engineer next to a structure he just constructed in the Kano irrigation project. And this is known as a, um, uh, I'll pronounce it in Dutch, a Begeman gate. Now, Dutch engineers were involved in this northern Nigerian irrigation project to irrigate some 24,000 hectares in the 1970s. And how to arrange water distribution was one of the key questions. And one of the Dutch team members, there was a Dutch consultancy involved, actually proposed to apply this Begeman gate we just saw to control water levels. Now this gate, Begeman, is uh, named after a Dutch irrigation engineer um, who introduced it in the 1920s in the Netherlands East Indies, which uh, as well already introduced was uh, my PhD topic, so I had to use that. Uh, so we talk about Netherlands East Indies, modern Indonesia. Now, at the time, there were uh, lots and lots of gates actually under discussion, and you see an impression here on the slide, on, uh, which includes a map of the main island of Java as well. Now, automatic gates had the advantage that water management in the irrigation systems constructed by the Dutch, and I quote, would become independent of the alertness of the operating personnel. Basically, you didn't need any humans anymore. So the gate that Begeman proposed was relatively simple. Uh, it was a hook type and it had a counterweight. And actually the first version of it was built by his sons uh, after his design with uh, Meccano bars, so toys. Uh, which made it easy to check, to play with it, to see what would happen, and things like that. Now, again, I had to show this image. That's how often our designs actually built with toys. Now, if you look at the design of research in the group I'm with at Delft University of Technology, we actually use quite a lot of toys in our research. So, um, if you play computer games, you can use the sensors to measure water levels and that kind of stuff. So, actually, there is a link to current research, but Let's not go into that today. Um, what is relevant for us today is that Dutch irrigation engineers proposed a structure in Nigeria, so a water management structure in Nigeria, which came from a former Dutch colony. So the Dutch proposed something they were familiar with. The Nigerian government had contracted another firm to actually help them controlling the Dutch. So the Dutch were advising the Nigerian government, and the, the other firm was helping the Nigerian government to understand what the Dutch were advising about. Now that firm was mainly employing Egyptian and Pakistani engineers, and they had their own ideas how to design a proper irrigation system with different structures and different ways of uh, computing canal systems. So the Kano River project, in northern Nigeria was a meeting place of Dutch engineers and Egyptian slash Pakistani British trained engineers on how to develop proper irrigation systems. 
Now, in this case, in the Nigerian case, a test was made to see which system performed best. So the Begemann gate was tested, uh, a British gate was tested, and actually an American gate was tested. And in this particular case, and this is not to show off that the Dutch were better, but the Begemann gate was actually selected. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this UK-Dutch comparison in terms of development cooperation and Dutch coming in and that kind of stuff. I, what I want to talk about is how to understand the differences in ideas, how to do things. So what I want to argue is that the process of expertise and experts being confronted with each other in Nigeria is a useful perspective to uh, employ when trying to understand um, linkages between flooding policies and processes in the two countries we talk about today, the United Kingdom and, and the Netherlands. And it's those similarities in the processes I would like to explore a little bit more uh, in detail. So I'll start with some theoretical notions about how to get into these comparisons and what type of things to look at. Um, then I will go into uh, uh, discussing uh, floods and flood types in the Netherlands as a kind of a reference and explain how uh, the Dutch situation could be understood in those theoretical terms. So I will try to explore the differences between a Dutch expert and, an, and a UK expert. Uh, and I'll talk to try to understand how these two situations, a Dutch irrigation engineer in Nigeria and a uh, English kid in the floods, having fun actually, but that's another thing, can be understood in the same terms and the same uh, conceptual notes. So let's do some theory there. Um, you need explanation on this one? <laughs> the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything? Yeah. 42? Good. The different schools of irrigation development uh, that clashed in Kano, in Nigeria, are actually examples of what is labeled as uh, traditions of practice, uh, so which are communities of practitioners that embody the, the, the information that that community shares plus the rules for action that they master. So how to do things is discussed and shared in those communities. So these, uh, these traditions, these traditions of practice, they define accepted technical operations, the encompass aspects of relevant scientific theory, um, engineering design formula, accepted procedures, and that kind of stuff. So how to do proper engineering. Uh, an important mechanism in this process of preference-guided selection of engineers within that community is actually education. Uh, graduating from engineering programs, like the one in Delft or Imperial College in London, is, is like complying with the, with the demands for community membership. You are only allowed in if you do the proper stuff. Now these, these rules, these, these how to do things, this, uh, this um, body of knowledge, is, is conditioned by factors as earlier innovations, um, how engineers look for solutions, available technical knowledge, um, some market demand, industrial structures. And um, this conditioning is then guided by the formalized knowledge that, that can be traced within this community in, 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 in shape of courses, in, in books, in, in documents. Um, but that's not enough. It needs to be reconfirmed by the engineers every day. I mean, reading something doesn't necessarily mean that you act upon it. So the action is very, very important. So these rules exist, how to do things, but they need to be continuously reconfirmed. And as such, they're continuously changed as well. I don't know any system that works as designed, but they still work. So something is happening there that confirms things that are happening, and it's also changing at the same time. Um, and these daily actions is what shapes this uh, technolo technological tradition, tradition of practice, or what I will employ today is a technological regime. So some of these rules are explicit, they are put in norms, they are put in uh, uh, official uh, documents that a bridge should be uh, this size, or you, have to, you need to have this much room to actually pass a train. Uh, some are more tacit, you don't do it because then it will collapse or something like that. And um, these rules are uh, what I want to discuss uh, a little bit 
more in detail today in terms of floods. Now, when I, say, when I talk about rules, I actually mean um, different types of, of <coughs> rules in the sense that uh, engineers, which we focus on a little bit uh, today, um, act um, s with rules in their mind on different levels. Let's keep the level word for the moment. Um, we start at the top of this pyramid, uh, triangle pyramid. We have guiding principles. So what would we actually like to, to, uh, to achieve, which is the, the, the values we want to share, we want to develop. And closely related to that are the promises and expectations. What do we think we will actually realize? So um, which will be translated into more specific requirements. What should the thing actually do? What should the technology actually be able to achieve? Um, to, in order to be able to do that, to design something, you need some kind of design tools, computations, uh, models, um, design methods, specifically prescribed ways how to go uh, uh, from a requirement to an artifact. And we also have artifacts and operational rules. Um, so we have the physical entities that actually uh, uh, perform a certain task, like the, the gate we just talked about. Um, and uh, we have uh, operational rules, how to do things. Now I will come back to this uh, rather abstract set of rules when I discuss flooding in the UK and the Netherlands, and I'll try to make clear how um, rules with these different levels, or different, at least different uh, ways to phrase it, um, to, to frame rules and, 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 and resources, make sense in terms of flooding. What I need to do now first is to uh, make clear that although I talk about levels and I even number those rules, this is not a, lo a, a logical hierarchy from one to five. It's not that you first define the guiding principles and then you do the promises and then you do the requirements and then you do the tools and then you come to artifacts. It's not that me mechanistic. Um, there are two things to say about that in terms of getting from the mechanistic functional connotation of this. Um, it is quite often the case that the higher level rules, so guiding principles and promises and expectations, typically involve more stakeholders. What to do with a flood policy typically involves civil servants, engineers, citizens, insurance companies, industries, where when it comes to actually making those principles more operational, so go to design tools and artifacts, typically the number of stakeholders involved is smaller. Artifacts are typically designed by engineers or scientists or relatively uh, well-defined groups of experts. So that's one thing. So there is a kind of a hierarchy in terms of involvement of stakeholders and uh, involvement of more uh, political issues. The other thing I, I, I want to say up front is that um, uh, these rules, as I said before, need to be continuously reconfirmed by actions. It's nice to be able to distinguish that people use these different rules. That doesn't necessarily mean that I follow them. So I would like to use these different uh, principles of rules and resources to uh, analyze current situations. I'm not suggesting that this is a useful thing to actually design new actions. It's a tool for analysis. It's not really something to, uh, to act upon, I guess. Uh, so I'm more interested in, in structure uh, and, and the structuring properties of these type of rules. So how is behavior of people influenced by them in the way that Anthony Giddens defined it before he became a politician? Uh, the discussion of structure. So that um, structure, structural properties, uh, the binding of time and space in social systems, the way that these rules are influencing our daily behavior and how that daily behavior is again reconfirming the rules. We have rules in this room right now. You sit there, I stand here. That's the way it's supposed to be right now. The fact that I'm talking and you're listening reconfirms that situation, right? I'm trying to speak English now, so I kind of confirm the English language. And the way I speak it actually changes it as well at the same time, because 
my English is not perfect. So this is kind of the things that are going on in daily life, and my argument is that it, the same goes on in terms of uh, engineering rules, how to um, develop policies, artifacts, uh, and that kind, of, that kind of things. So rules are stable because they do influence our actions, but they also are changing, so they're not static. They're stable, but not static. And in that sense, we come very close to um, what uh, French philosopher, sociologist Bruno Latour would uh, argue in his actor network theory that actors are uh, continuously creating and recreating networks in which they uh, uh, link themselves to other human agents and uh, non-human uh, intermediaries like artifacts or rules or structures. Um, and as such, create a new reality which is pretty close to the existing reality but not exactly the same. So the actor brings in the world um, to the local. So to the, the world is brought to the local by the actor and at the same time the world is created by that local, uh, local actor. Uh, and the, lo the local is, as the tour would phrase it, pumped back into the world. So what I want to explore now is how this creation, recreation, structuring, new developments, uh, new actions works in terms of flood policies. And as I said, I will start with the Netherlands. So let's do a bit of a geographical test here. This is the geography of the Netherlands, high parts, well, okay, high for Dutch standards, in the east and the south. The highest part is in the south, which is uh, about 300 meters. When I was in Peru, they didn't believe me. They thought I meant 3,000, <laughs> but it's not. Um, and Delft, the city I live in, is depicted in what I think is a green circle, but I'm colorblind, so I hope it's green. Somebody checked it, and it was green at the time. Um, now, when we talk about flooding in the Netherlands, this is the area which is actually below sea level. Um, the Dutch, the Netherlands is known for being below sea level, right? So actually 26% 20, of the country's surface is below sea level. And I should say below mean sea level, which is uh, the reference in the Netherlands. Now, the actual threat of flooding is larger, because this uh, on the right is the total area which is prone to flooding, both from the sea and from the rivers, which is 55% um, in total. So 26 is under sea level, 29% is flood prone uh, from rivers, and actually 4% of the Dutch surface area is not protected against flooding. So it's outside the protected areas. So a total of 59% of the Netherlands is susceptible for floods from rivers or sea. Um, I, I mention these figures because they're often confused. Quite often people say that 55 or more than half of the, of the Dutch countryside is below sea level. It's not, it's, 20, it's still 26%, which is quite a lot, but it's not more than half. And even uh, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made that mistake, which was of course immediately used for political discussions about how valuable the report as a whole was, which is not what I want to do today, actually. I just want to show how easy it is to confuse these numbers. And uh, even Dutch people would be happy to confirm that more than half of the Netherlands is below sea level. It's not, okay? Lesson one. Um, so putting these percentages aside, without adequate flood protection, most of the Netherlands would be flooded every now and then, not necessarily all the time. So it could be that it's flooded at, low, at high tide and not at low tide, but more than half of the Netherlands would have a flood issue. Um, it doesn't, again, doesn't mean that everything was, would be under meters of water. Uh, again, to take the example of uh, the city of Delft, which is uh, uh, exactly, well, the center of Delft is exactly on mean sea level, which means that it would be flooded by, with, during high tide and it would not be flooded during low tide. Now, I live in the south of Delft, which is uh, a few meters below mean sea level, 
two meters or so. That means that in my house, there would always be water. My ground floor would always be flooded if there wouldn't be flood protection. So it, it depends where you are, and it depends what the source of flooding is, whether you will actually have a major problem or not. Sometimes water takes quite a long time to get to a certain area because of the geography or the, the topography of the, the, the micro um, levels and things. Sometimes there's not enough water to flood an area. So there's, uh, could be flood prone, but it will not be flooded because there is not enough water. Um, but again, without measures, half of the Netherlands would be flooded quite a lot from the rivers and the sea. So in order to deal with that, uh, the Dutch uh, surface area is organized into so-called embankment areas. And an embankment area is a region which is protected by one set of embankments and as such can be treated as a unit. Um, I'm not sure, well, let's look at the southwest. So, for example, numbers 29 and 30. 29 and 30, so this is one unit. So this is the embankment for this unit. Now, the colors are not as clear as they are on my screen, but I hope you see that there are two one, uh, darker ones, which are actually dark red. Um, and that is a higher level of protection than this color or this color. So this one is the highest level, and I'll explain how that level is determined. So for each of these areas, uh, an accepted occurrence of flooding is defined first. So in general terms, in areas with higher economic value or more people, um, higher standards are prescribed than for areas with less economic value and or less people. Actually, the actual levels which are shown in this slide are under debate as we speak because of changes in the Netherlands, more people, more to protect, and also actually discussion whether we should not have equal protection for the whole country. But for the moment, these are the official protection levels that we have. So we define first how important is it to protect a certain area. Then we, the Dutch uh, uh, government, translate that occurrence into a statistical norm. So the how often needs to be specified, it needs to have a statistical number. Um, will an event that occurs every year be the norm? Or will it be uh, much more severe? I hope, I mean, uh, an event that happens every year is not really a big event, right? I mean, it's wet every year if you protect it against that. But what you wanna do is protect against the extremes. But how extreme should an event be in order to protect you? Uh, someone against? Is it every 10 years, every 100 years, every 1,000 years? Uh, or I should actually express it in terms of the, uh, the probability per year. So is it once, uh, one in 100 each year? Is it one in 500 each year? Is it one in 10,000 each year? Now for the, the different uh, levels of safety in the Netherlands at the moment are as on this slide. On the, the, the western part with high economic value and a lot of people. Most of the Dutch live uh, uh, in this area, basically. Um, the allowed occurrence of flooding or the probability of flooding is one in 10,000 each year. It could have been one in 9,999, I mean, as Basically, as much as you probably know, I wouldn't actually know what one in 10,000 kind of means. It's a statistical term, right? It's determined based on the measures we, measurements we have and it's, it's, it's being uh, computed. But one, one in 10,000, it's kind of a difficult thing for, for uh, uh, normal human understanding. But it is uh, defined uh, in, 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 in such a statistical norm. Now, if we look at the river area, um, we go to a much lower norm of one, once, 1 in 1250, which is still pretty high. Uh, 
pretty high standard, but it's lower than the coastal areas. Now, these events, one in 10,000, so the, the events, the discharge events that can happen every uh, once in 10,000 per year or every once in 1250 per year can be then translated into a water level in a uh, water body. So it's either high sea levels, which can occur with a certain probability, or it's high river levels, which can occur with a certain probability. And those water levels then can be used to actually design the protection measures that we have. So the embankments of this area are designed with water levels that could occur with a chance of one in 10,000 each year. These embankments are created with a lower level of safety. So this basically, what I try to do now is to explain how a political decision to protect certain areas with a certain level of safety is translated through statistics in a water level that engineers can work with. So that's, and for each of these flood prone areas in the Netherlands, this is defined and this is being done. And much of this um, uh, work to, uh, to realize those uh, flood safety levels is done by the National Ministry of Public Works, which is responsible for the main water bodies depicted on this map. And as such, it's responsible for um, the famous Oosterschelde barrier in the southwest or the uh, barrier in Rotterdam Harbor. Um, to give an idea of scale, each of these gates, if you would put it straight up, it's the Eiffel Tower. Okay? Just as a measure of scale. I didn't put the Eiffel Tower here, but believe me, it's as big as that. The other thing that the public works does is construct the river embankments. Now, um, when I say constructing, it means that it doesn't manage them. The management is done by the water board. So this, uh, this embankment is, you can kind of see a river embankment as public works constructing them, but the water board managing them. So as this irrigation structure I used as an example in the, at the beginning of this lecture, was a meeting place for engineers of different uh, nationalities to discuss things. The embankments in the Netherlands are the meeting place between the water board managing the uh, embankments and controlling its safety and public works actually constructing it. Now these water boards, um, this map still depicts 25, actually you have 23 right now because they're still merging. Um, those are the, the government bodies that are responsible for daily water management. So they are the ones that are responsible for flood protection, for controlling the embankments, for ensuring that the pumps are working, and for making sure that their areas are actually safe. And as you can see, um, this was our area that was protected, but it doesn't have one water board. It does have several water boards within that. And water boards are, in general, responsible for general water management in the area. They're also responsible for water quality, and quite a few of them are also responsible for some roads in their area, although not all. And they are responsible for the embankments. So we have specific government uh, entities responsible for this water management. And to give you an example, again from the area I live in, uh, Delft is in the middle of the Delftland water board which is actually one of the oldest water boards uh, in the Netherlands. In uh, last year, it celebrated its uh, 725th birthday. Um, and it has a very diverse area. It's highly urbanized, but it has about uh, 81 different areas with different water levels. And they all are pumping water to uh, higher canals that drain water out. So each of these black things are pumps bringing water from these lower areas into the higher belt system. Because most of this area is uh, lower than uh, water levels in the sea or in the rivers, at least part of the time. And this water is then brought out through four pumping stations to uh, the North Sea or Rotterdam Harbor.
Now, sometimes it rains a bit much, as in the UK last year. And then even Dutch systems don't necessarily work well. Dutch drainage systems in polders are designed for a certain amount of rainfall. Um, on average, all the Dutch uh, areas have excess rainfall uh, on a yearly basis. But of course, the average never occurs. So um, pumps are designed for uh, peak events. Um, and when it rains more than the peak event, you cannot pump water out anymore. And you need to store it, or your area will flood. As for example, in uh, uh, 1998, when this is actually supposed to be uh, well, drier than this, let's put it that way. In 1998, we had about 100 millimeters of rainfall in two hours. And if you, notice that, if you know that the Dutch water systems are typically designed to cope with rainfall events of 12 to 14 millimeters, we have an excess amount of rainfall of at least 80, 80 millimeters on, uh, on this uh, floor, for example, might not sound like much, but if that all flows to one point, you have a lot of water, right? If 80 millimeters falls there, you will drown. They will not. So it's an issue of where the water flows to. So this uh, accumulates at the low points. You're in danger. So what I want to suggest here is that flooding in the Netherlands is kind of complicated because we have floods from the sea with tidal effects, with huge amount of water, very high threats. We have floods from the river, which large amount of water, but it comes in waves. And it, it, it basically offers a threat uh, in river areas. But we also have floods from rainfall, where there's no river or sea or whatever. It's simply excess water on, 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 a, on the surface. Nobody dies, but there's a lot of economic damage. Now, the mixed duties for this I also touched upon. We have public works. We have water boards. We also have provinces coming in, because they kind of supervise water boards. When there is an actual disaster, so in case you would flood, for example, the, the, the mayor of the municipality comes in to deal with the disaster. When there's a disaster that uh, links more than one municipality, there's actually a safety region coming in. So I'm not saying that Dutch water management is simple. Um, actually, with the European Union coming in, it's becoming more and more complex, although not definitely, not, not, not really changing in terms of responsibilities. So Dutch water management is not simple, but it's definitely organized. This is a Dutch artist, by the way. <laughs> now, what I try to say here is that the Dutch have guiding principles in terms of we want to present floods. Water needs to stay out. The western part of the country has the highest protection levels. That is translated into design requirements, which is defined as safety levels. And it's a probability of flooding, which is prescribed in certain areas. I didn't talk much about design tools, but I touched upon the artifacts that I used, which are embankments, barriers, pumps, disaster procedures. Who is making the decisions when something goes wrong? Now, keep this in mind, right? We have uh, a set of rules that are used in Dutch flood policy. Now, how does that link to the UK? You might recognize this image. I'm not sure how many of you live in this image. but If you look at the UK in comparison to the Netherlands, um, there are a lot of things that are pretty similar. The UK has different flood threats as well. You have larger rivers, you have the sea, you have uh, rainfall. So in that sense, there is not a big difference in, in, in general terms. There are different things to deal with. There are different entities that deal with that. There are a lot of discussions which are very similar, including urbanization, including climate change. If you look at the artifacts, they are very similar too. Pumping stations, emergency pumps. Uh, I noticed in the, in, the, in the UK newspapers of last year that there were complaints that the, the management entities in the UK had to employ uh, emergency pumps to get rid of the water, Dutch water boards have emergency pumps as well. At, uh, actually, they don't owe them, they don't have them, they 
can uh, use them from private companies. They have contracts to actually use them from private companies. So emergency situations, in a sense, are very similar too. You have to bring pumps from outside if the standard is not met. Um, we have embankments all over the place. These are um, English embankments or UK em embankments, but you could find similar type of embankments, including same levels in, in the Netherlands. Um, you have your own iconic barrier, or should I say London has its own iconic barrier, which adds to the many tourist attractions the city already has, and hopefully keeps the city safe from flooding as well. So if we look at management responsibilities, at first sight, uh, the UK is as, as, as scattered in terms of management responsibilities as, uh, as the Netherlands. Although I must confess that when I look at this financing scheme of UK flood policies, it's a bit complicated, isn't it? If you compare it to the Netherlands, we have public works and the water boards, which are the entities that define flood investments, flood protection investments, and of course uh, that uh, there are some other agencies involved in terms of discussions, but the main uh, agencies are two, a national one and a regional one. But I think we have to go slightly deeper in terms uh, of, of comparison between the UK and the Netherlands to find out what, how we can understand these differences a bit better. And I want to focus on two things in the last part of my presentation. I want to talk about the hydrology of floods in the UK, at least the floods we saw last year and a couple of years ago, and I want to talk about how those measures are financed, who pays, and for what. Now, when we look at hydrology, this is the most technical slide in the presentation. Um, what I want to focus on is that rainfall, which is set here, so it rains on day one, on day two, on day three, and day four, is changed into something like discharge. So this is the scale of the rainfall, this is the scale of the discharge, forget the numbers. The point is, rainfall is turned into discharge over time. And what I want to talk about a little bit is how that is done. And I use the con concept of lag time for that. Basically, lag time means the time between the rainfall event and the flood event, or the discharge. Because it doesn't immediately flood, or you don't immediately have a high discharge when it rains. It takes a bit of time, depending on uh, geography, depending on soil properties. Uh, you can imagine that if it rains in an urban area, you will have uh, faster runoff than in a rural area. Now, um, typically a river with a short lag time and a high discharge is a problem, right? You have a lot of water very soon. You would like to have rivers with a longer lag time and a low discharge because then you can just wait, nothing happens. Unfortunately, UK rivers have short lag times and relatively high discharges. So the UK rivers are the worst ones in terms of flooding. I'm sorry. It's, it's enhanced by building activities in, 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 in catchments. It's enhanced by more uh, uh, paved uh, areas so that you, have, you might have more uh, runoff. Uh, the damage done by those rivers might be more because uh, houses are building floodplains, but the basic principle still is the UK doesn't have the handiest rivers in terms of flooding. If you compare it to the Netherlands, so this, this, this happens, right? If you compare it to the Netherlands, we, most of our rivers have a longer lag time, still high discharges, but most of the dis discharge comes from Germany or from Belgium, and we have a bit of time to actually see what's going to happen. And even then, it might mean that Germany floods first. Now, the problem is that although the floods come from Germany, it doesn't mean that they come with the accuracy you associate with that origin. You cannot really predict the floods from Germany that well, because it depends on the amount of water, it depends on the, um, on the, on the, the behavior of the flood system, on the protection measures that the Germans are taking or not. So we have a, a certain unpredictability as well. But compared to the UK situations, 
the Dutch rivers are very uh, predictable. It doesn't always work. In 1995, we had Anna, quite a difficult flood wave to predict, and we had already high water levels and stress on the embankments. So then about 250,000 people had to be evacuated in the river areas. I should know, I evacuated my parents as well. And the goat and the chickens. The goat had a great time actually those four days because he could stay in a stable with a very nice horse. But 250,000 people from these areas had to move out. And you can imagine that this is quite an operation. Nothing happened, fortunately, but in order to make sure that nothing would have happened, in case of floods, those people had to move. Now imagine if the prediction for that flood would have been one day wrong and the flood would have come when people were on the move. That would have been a big, big disaster. So we have our prediction issues, but we can talk about it in terms of days. The UK talks about it in terms of hours. And when we have a small time step problem, so a very quick discharge, it's not a river problem, it's a rainfall problem. So it's basically rainfall flowing there and collecting here. So it's a very local problem. It's not a river as in the UK where you actually have discharge from that. So my argument would be that the Dutch are known for their river stuff and for their sea stuff, but it's a different type of flood than most of the UK problems of last year. The UK has flash flooding, which is not something the Dutch are really good at in principle. I'm not saying we're bad at it, but it's not something we are known for. Now the other main difference I want to talk about is who pays. And I want to use the uh, concept of risk for that. Risk is basically the probability of an event multiplied by the effect of the event. So if you have a, uh, an, an event that happens every day with a very low damage, that is, of course, much better than an event that happens every day with a high damage. So the risk of the first event is much lower than the risk of the second event. At the same time, I can have an event that happens very often, uh, uh, has a low damage, could have the same risk as something that happens not a lot, but has a high damage, if you compare the two. Now, it's not about what the actual risk is, it's about the decision you can make. If you, have, if, you, if you look at a risk perception, you can look at trying to prevent the actual event itself, so you invest all your money in making sure that the chance of the event happening is minimal and you don't care too much about what happens when the event happens, or you try to focus on the uh, effects of the event. So you can, you can invest in two places, either prevention or dealing with the damage. And you could still be on the same level of risk. Now the, the Dutch, as I showed you, invest heavily in preventing flooding events to happen. On the other hand, the UK policy is much more focusing on dealing with the damage being <coughs> done by floods. So this, this, the amount of money spent on the system might actually be the same, but the question is who spends it. In the Netherlands, it's the government that invests in protection these areas, protecting these areas, and done in such a way that it actually has done a lot of measures to either divert floodwaters away from the, from the west or make sure that the floodwaters cannot flow to the west. In, in Dutch history, we actually had quite a few examples when this area flooded because water could not flow to this area. Um, we're still one nation, so apparently it's forgiven, but people in the east actually drowned to protect the west. It wasn't their choice, by the way. They were forced to. In the UK, the idea is that more frequent flooding can be allowed, but that the damage needs to be paid for. And that's where insurance comes in. So insurance is much more important in the UK. I'm not saying it's a good policy, right? I'm just trying to explain the difference. Um, and 
what I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the total amount of money in the UK spent on flood defense is the same as in the Netherlands in relative terms. We know that the UK spends less on flood defenses than the Netherlands. I think the Netherlands spends about 1.3 uh, billion, right, euros? And I think the UK spends about 600 million euros. But a lot of UK citizens pay an insurance fee against flooding. Now, if you account for that amount of money, it could actually be the same amount in total. But it's a different perception. It's investing in damage control, not in flood protection. And in that sense, the UK might actually have a very high cost benefit in terms of return on investment. It might not have the best policy in terms of return on floods. I'm not sure, actually. But what I want to stress is that the Dutch policies are to prevent floods. The UK policies' main aim is to deal with the damage of floods. They both are expressed in safety levels, so the way to deal with that is the same. The outcomes are obviously different because the guiding principles are different, but what I want to get at now is that if you compare the UK situation and the Dutch situation, the main difference is the decision what are you actually... Did I do that? To stress the point again, I did this. Um, what do you actually focus on? Do you want to prevent flooding? Or do you want to prevent certain amounts of flooding? But do you, are you more interested in dealing with the effects of flooding? And that is the big difference between the UK and the Netherlands. So if you look at this quote, which is slightly long, but let's at the first, let's focus on the first part. This is from the uh, uh, environmental agency, UK environmental agency. If you would start a quote in the Netherlands with flooding happens, nobody would take you seriously anymore. Even though it might be true. But the whole policy is to <coughs> prevent flooding. So it's not about whether this is true or not. It's, this is a, an expression of a different approach of flooding. And that's what I want to, uh, to focus on. And that's what I want to emphasize when we discuss the differences between the UK and the Netherlands. It's not so much that the Dutch cannot bring something to the UK, but it's especially this different policy between the UK and the Netherlands that needs uh, explaining a lot better before you can actually say that the Dutch way of dealing with flooding can help the UK or not. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you.